Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, yes. Yeah, so like uh, Victor said, I'm Tom Dickman, um, and I work over at Fold. And I'm just going to be talking through how we run LND in production. Um, so before I get started, oh, uh, before I get started, just to give some background on what Fold is. Um, so Fold is a company, um, and we have basically a mobile app and a website um, that allow you to earn Bitcoin back on your everyday purchases. Um, so within our mobile app, you can pay using a credit card, you can use on-chain payments, or using Lightning payments. And then we have sort of a second project that we, this is sort of how we first uh, sort of played around with Lightning, we, uh, called Lightning Pizza. And you can basically buy pizza over the Lightning network. Um, so just a quick summary of what I'm going to be going through today. Um, so as you can imagine, we accept Lightning payments, so we're running Lightning nodes. We chose LND as our sort of implementation of the node, um, which is written by Lightning Labs um, in Golang. Um, and so I'm going to be talking through sort of how we think about running our nodes, um, some of the security implications we sort of keep in mind as we run it, and then just general channel maintenance um, of your node after it's running. And I'll put a, there's going to be a link at the end of the presentation, but Alex actually gave a really great talk about the security implications of running a node, and he gets into like the internals of how the node actually operates and everything, and it's, uh, you should definitely check it out. Um, so before I talk about specifically how we run our nodes, I just wanted to give background on how we think about infrastructure at Fold and how we run like our app and everything else. Um, so if we start, if you're thinking about LND, if you want to run LND, how do you actually go about doing this? So you could spin up a virtual machine um, and spin up, say, a Bitcoin D node and basically start LND. Um, and at this point, you'll have an LND node, you'll have a Bitcoin D node, and maybe you'll uh, also spin up like an app server. Um, and so, you're, so you have three virtual machines at this point, um, and maybe you need multiple app servers because you have to be able to handle the demand um, from customers. Um, and maybe you spin up another app server because you're using microservices. And so at some point, you, you end up with a lot of complexity um, just from the number of things that you're running and securing communication between them um, and managing them. So sort of one option for solving that problem, Kubernetes. So this, it's basically an open source system for automating the deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications, uh, which basically means you can give it an application um, and its dependencies um, and a list of basically system resources and like tell it how you want it to run it. And then it takes care of actually scheduling it on one of the, um, basically on the resources that you give it. So you'll give it a bunch of virtual machines, maybe some uh, disks and some network access. And then I don't want to go into too much depth on this, but um, it'll be helpful as I explain how we actually run LND. So Helm is basically a, a packaging system that sits on top of uh, Kubernetes and just allows you to um, set up your application. So specifically Helm, it's split into basically a chart and then like environment specific data, whereas a, a chart is basically the, um, the resources that your application needs to run. So it would be for Bitcoin D, you need a persistent disk, you need um, some sort of like incoming network access um, from the outside world, and you need your actual application. So you'd have like a Docker image. And then there's environment specific data such as like, are you running on testnet or mainnet? What disk size are you using? Um, and what specific ports are you using? Um, so yeah, so we um, basically using this, there is a Bitcoin D, uh, what's known as a Helm chart, that's available um, that someone else made that you can basically use, you can install inside of your Kubernetes cluster and you'll have Bitcoin D running with a disk attached to it um, and fully synced and everything. So um, we actually built basically an LND um, Helm chart, and this is just a copy of LND built as a Docker image, um, and then an optional loop D server running alongside it, so you can do like loop out and loop in operations. Um, and so this is basically, like I said, LND running with like a persistent disk backing it and a couple ports forwarded. So at this point, 
you can basically run LND and Bitcoin D, um, and you have an L, uh, an, a node running. And so I'll have a link at the end, but we, we published like the Helm chart that we created in the Docker images, um, if you want to check it out. And then, let's see, okay, so next I'm going to be talking through sort of how we think about, so we've got a node running, how do we think about actually configuring it um, for running? So the first piece that you want to sort of keep in mind is um, access control. So depending on where you're running, you might be running on Google Cloud, AWS, Kubernetes, whatever. Um, they'll all have different ways of handling security and like limiting access. So like the first step is just limit who has access to the limited set of participants that you can. So in Kubernetes, there's like RBOC rules, which are um, you can limit what users and what applications have access to what ports um, on the application. So you could limit access just to your, say, proxy server sitting in front of your LND node or just to your application. Um, and then like in AWS, if it was running on a virtual machine, you might set up, use IAM roles or like a firewall in front of it. And then the, this is sort of related to access control. Um, but one thing, um, so LND, when you spin it up, um, it sort of has issues if you have a very large number of channels. Um, and this has gotten better over time, so it's less of a problem. But I would definitely recommend when you first start that you set like a minimum channel size. We use, I think, 0.05 Bitcoin. And this doesn't mean people can't pay you if they don't want to lock up that much money. Um, but, it, but it means that they might have to go through like LN Big or some other uh, some other node to connect to you. And I think as you get more comfortable with actually running your node and managing your channels, you can figure out um, if you want to lower that and maybe get, be, be uh, more connected with uh, direct customers. And then the next piece is um, macaroons. So within LND, um, there's, basic, there's the concept of macaroons, which is just like a little, it's a bearer token that you send as part of your RPC calls. Um, and this specifies, specifically specifies what level of permissions you have uh, with your node. So by default, LND gives you uh, read-only, invoice, and admin macaroons. And those are pretty self-explanatory. Um, but basically, for example, if you were just, gen just receiving money, you could just use an invoice macaroon. Um, and anyone who has access to that can't steal funds from your node, they can just send you money. And then I'm going to talk about, I guess, looks so like it might be missing a slide. Oh, they're backwards, okay. So, so first I wanted to talk through um, receiving funds. So basically, if you're running a node, um, if you're running a Lightning node, it, this is somewhat different than running a, just a regular Bitcoin node and receiving funds, because you have to have a hotkey um, on your node um, in order to be able to receive funds. And you can limit access as much as possible, but you still have a hotkey running on the node, so you want to like, limit access, set up a firewall in front of it, and do whatever's uh, sort of possible. Um, and then the second piece is you'll have potentially routing challenges that aren't visible to you as the node owner. Um, so the, the sender of the funds is actually the one that proposes the route um, that the funds get sent over. So you won't know unless they tell you that they couldn't send funds to you. So it's, um, it's up to their routing algorithm and it's up to their ability to find a route um, to send funds to you. So the best thing you can do is just make sure you're well connected to the bigger nodes. So LNBIG um, and async are two good options. Um, but you can also just look at where payments generally come from to your node. And then the second bit, so say you want to actually send funds. Again, there's potential routing challenges that will be visible to you now. Um, but the second piece is um, how do you want to think about trying to limit, um, sort of limit funds from being stolen from your node? So maybe you have a bug in your software. Um, someone could come in and just take all of your funds. So you can, um, there's a few options that I've seen discussed. You could set up sort of a node in between you and the outside world that sets up some sort of uh, outbound restrictions. And this would obviously require modifying a node to make it work. 
um, but it's an interesting option. The second option is you could set up sort of a thin wrapper in front of LND that just acts as a, a proxy um, for the RPC calls and sets up an audit trail for all the payments you make and maybe keeps track of um, and sends out an alert if you break some threshold over some time period or has like an approval process for um, sending uh, larger amounts. And then I guess this is a piece where LND is, um, or Lightning specifically, is definitely different than running just a regular Bitcoin node and receiving funds. Um, and it reminds me of the early days of regular Bitcoin where you ran a node and you kept backups of the, uh, the data directory behind your node um, versus being able to like back up 24 words and uh, having all your funds safe. So it's very similar for LND. You want to back up the directory, um, but there are some risks to doing that. So if you back up the directory as snapshots, and for some reason you have a slightly out of date backup and you try to restore it, you could end up restoring channels and basically um, lose funds um, because you're using an out of date state. So the b best things you can do here is set up a rate array um, or some sort of, sort of uh, regionally separated disks um, backing, your, backing your node and then set up static channel backups as sort of a last ditch. Um, step in case your node gets completely corrupted. And static channel backups will allow you to restore the funds, um, basically ask your peer to restore the funds, um, but you'll have to basically shut down your node and all your channels in the process. So um, you don't want to do that if you don't have to. Um, and then one last piece is I would recommend running multiple nodes. So this will give you a few benefits. If you're running multiple nodes, you can um, you can basically handle upgrades without actually having any downtime, assuming you have both nodes fairly well connected. So you can stop generating invoices on one, wait until all your invoices expire, and then uh, upgrade it while you're generating invoices on the other, and then swap them out. Um, it also allows you, in case one of your disks does get corrupted, you can use your static channel backup and still continue serving your website with your second node. Um, and then actually also, if you're, this allows you to handle a lot more channels as well, um, cleanly. And then next, I just wanted to talk through sort of three pieces we think about um, for channel or for node maintenance specifically. So we have a node that's running. We have channels between us and a number of different peers. And we have some amount of funds on either side that we can send. Um, in general, you want to keep this fairly balanced. Um, there isn't like a s specific uh, state that you want it to be in, but fairly balanced so you can sort of send funds in both directions. Um, and you can accomplish this basically by just sending yourself a payment through a specific route. So you might send funds over through the right node on the right, um, down to the bottom back to yourself and you can essentially rebalance your channels. Um, and in general, this is, it's fairly good to do, but we've found there, the tools for it are still very early stage and it's still, um, it's still very much a manual process. Um, I'm hoping within the next few years we'll get to a point where you can just sort of describe your desired state for your node and it can um, automatically handle rebalancing for you. And the, the second option is looping out. So this is actually a service provided by um, the Lightning Labs team. And it's just basically submarine swaps, or actually in Looping Out's case, it's a reverse submarine swaps. And it basically allows you to take on-chain funds and convert them to off-chain funds. Um, and this is a pretty great way to get funds um, out of your node. Um, but currently, like the max that you can uh, loop out of your node is 0.02 Bitcoin. Um, which is, um, especially if you're receiving a lot of money, makes it pretty darn hard to get your funds out of your node. Um, and it can be, it's actually not super expensive, so you pay on the order of 0.1 to 0.2% um, for the loop out operations. And then, I guess the last option you have is just closing out channels. So if you're primarily receive only, um, which we are in our case right now because we don't offer withdrawals over Lightning yet. 
um, you'll end up with a bunch of channels from a single peer. So like LNBIG and async both have a fairly large number of channels with us, and the funds over time all end up on your side, and your peer really has no incentive to close them out because it's inbound capacity. Um, and if you're primarily receive only and you have five channels, three of which are all on your side, you could close out two, and it's not gonna affect your routing. Um, and this allows you to get funds on chain um, fairly easily. So, yeah, so that's it. Um, it's sort of a walkthrough of how we think about running a node. Um, I don't know how long we have, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Completely independent nodes. Hello? Hello? All right, cool. Um, yeah, so right now you, you're asking about running multiple nodes um, if they can share the same channels, basically. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, if uh, multiple nodes can share channels so that they are not completely independent nodes, but kind of fallback. Uh, no actual fallback nodes on the same set of channels. Yeah, I mean, not currently. I think that ideally you would be able to run multiple nodes, like you said, that maybe share the same database or like essentially so you can load balance between multiple nodes. But yeah, right now it's two completely separate nodes with unique node IDs and you basically just try to make them both well connected. Um, and you'll, typically you would connect between the two with a channel of your own um, and this would allow as long as both are online, you can still receive funds even if someone was connected to one. Hi. Um, so how do you handle, like, having multiple nodes? How do you handle when you are doing, like, a deployment and you have one node down? If you have some pending invoices in the other node, do you actually uh, wait uh, for all the invoices to be settled, or, or how do you manage that? Yeah, so if it's in the good state where we know we're doing the, like, we know we're restarting the nodes, we would stop generating invoices on one of the nodes, wait for all of them to expire, and then restart it. Um, in the worst case, we may, like, if it restarts because the node is running on crashes, um, in that case, you would end up with invoices that are um, pending and a user can't pay. And I think that's why I'm curious to see what um, sort of higher availability modes we can come up with for Lightning. Because um, right now, it very much is. You're running a single node, and um, you just have to hope it's well connected. Any other questions? We still have time for one or two more. All right. Oh, awesome. Hi. Um, I'm interested to know how you handle the auto unlocking of LND in your Kubernetes environment. Because when, when your node starts up after a deployment, you obviously have to unlock it with the wallet password, right? Yeah, so, I mean, that's a piece, it's not perfect yet, but basically we use, within Kubernetes you can have secrets, and that secret is stored in etcd encrypted, and it's basically, when the node comes up, we make an RPC call to unlock the node using that password. I think ideally we would be able to store it like in a, I don't know, hardware security module, or like something more secure. Uh, so we're also running some of this stuff in Kubernetes. We, we do a similar thing. Um, we use a system called um, Camus. I don't know if you've looked into that. It's like there's, there's a few options like Helm secrets, sealed secrets, and then Camus is one that you can plug into like a KMS, like a Google KMS or something like that. Um, so you can fetch the encrypted secrets from a like hardware module and unlock it that way. Huh? Yeah, I'll check that out. Well, we are right on time. Please put together a big round of applause. Thank you very much, Tom.